morning and welcome to our Zoom service for August 22nd as we gather for worship. I hope that you are well and appreciating the Zoom services as they continue through the summer. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Linda Greenwood Cuppins and I am honored to be leading the in-person worship service at McClure United Church today while Jim is on a well-deserved vacation. Next week, Yvonne Simpson will be leading the in-person worship service. I understand that the Zoom service is well attended and a part of many people's Sunday routines. My sincere gratitude to all of the people that helped to make the Zoom services happen. Larry and Joanne, Sandy, Margaret, Trent, and the choir members. Thank you all for doing so much to make these services available for those who are here today and those who may watch the video later on YouTube. There is one announcement, a reminder of the concert being held on the lawn at the church led by Dan Davis and friends. The concert is next Sunday, August 29th, weather permitting. Tickets are $17 each or $15 for students and the tickets are available through Eventbrite and the church. Thank you also to Dennis and Sharon for your coordination of this event and for answering questions that people may have. A reminder to everyone Bring your lawn chair when you come to enjoy the jazz music. That is the announcement for today. Have a blessed service. Have a wonderful week. I miss you all. Blessings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and also with you. Come to Christ, whose words are words of eternal life. We have faith, knowing that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Let us worship God, who sets us free and gives us new life. Let us pray. In this house of prayer, O God, we invoke your name. There is no one like you who keeps covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Not only have you lived on earth in Christ, but by the Spirit live in our hearts. Regard our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let us make our confession before God and one another. Let us pray. God of the promise, you have declared yourself to be our heavenly parent through Jesus Christ. Forgive our denial of your promised care through anxiety and our hesitancy to identify ourselves with you, despite your past provision for our needs. We are sorry for the disloyalty we have shown you from time to time through our rejection of the Church. Absolve us for the sake of your ever-loyal Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ loved the Church and gave himself for it, to consecrate it, cleansing it by water and word, so that he might present the Church to himself all glorious, with no stain or wrinkle or anything of the sort, but holy and without blemish. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. The first reading is from Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The second reading is from John, chapter 6, verses 56 to 69. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever partakes will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones who did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. 
Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the Church. Thanks be to God. join me in prayer. Lord, as you taught us in the Psalm of David, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you now and always. Amen. And many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easier for me to identify with the crowds who misunderstand and question Jesus than with Jesus himself or the disciples. This is one of those times. To understand what I mean though, we have to recall just what Jesus has been saying here and throughout the sixth chapter of John. That Jesus, for instance, is the bread of life. That he provides the only food which truly nourishes that he gives us his own self, his own flesh and blood, to sustain us on our journey, that we are actually to eat his flesh and blood in order to abide in him. These are, indeed, hard words, hard to hear, hard to understand, hard to believe. No wonder, then, that many of those following Jesus now desert him, and at this point we need to be careful, for it's always tempting to write off those who gave up on Jesus as people too stupid or lazy or unfaithful to believe. But note that John calls these folks not simply the crowds, as in earlier passages, but rather disciples. The people in today's reading who now desert Jesus are precisely those who had, 
in fact, believed in Jesus, those who had followed him and had given up so much to do so. But now, finally, after all their waiting and watching and wondering and worrying, they have grown tired, and they can no longer see clearly what it was about Jesus that attracted them to him in the first place, and so they leave. And who can blame them? Are we really all that different? I mean, which of us has not at one time or another wondered whether we have believed in vain? During the dark of the night, perhaps, watching and praying by the bedside of a loved one in the hospital, wondering why in the world they are so sick and whether they will ever recover. Or while cooking supper and thinking about your family and wondering why things have not turned out the way you had hoped. At these times, and my word, but if we're honest, we have to admit that there are so many of these kinds of times in our lives. At these times, aren't we tempted to conclude that the promises we trusted were empty and the faith we once held was misplaced? Perhaps we don't renounce or desert the Lord openly. We just don't make the extra effort to go to church regularly. Or we reduce what we've been given. Or are more reluctant to help others. Or simply stop praying until in the end, we end up just like the disciples in today's reading. And so I think, we can probably conclude that while the picture John draws for us in today's gospel is not a pretty one, it's probably a pretty realistic portrait of disbelief, of disciples then and now, for whom the life of faith has become too hard. But at the same time, John's picture is also one of belief, of courage, and of faith. For as John writes, after many disciples drew back and no longer followed him, Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where I've often wondered, do Peter and the other twelve get their faith? Or to put it another way, what makes them different from all those who gave up on Jesus and went away? Now in asking this question, we must again be careful. For as easy as it is to write off those other disciples as stupid or blind unbelievers, it's even easier to imagine Peter and the rest as flawless faith giants. And this, as each of the four evangelists point out, was simply not the case. For these disciples were also plagued by doubt and fear. They suffered at times from an overabundance of pride or a lack of courage. And they too eventually deserted Jesus. And at the very time he needed them the most. So if they aren't smarter or more faithful or more courageous or in short any better than the rest of Jesus' disciples, then or now, then what is it that sets them apart? One thing. Listen again to Peter. Lord, he replies to Jesus' question, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter, you see, knew where to look. That's it. That's what makes him and the other disciples different. It's not their brains or their ability or their status or even their faith. They simply know where to look, to Jesus, and they keep their eyes fastened on him. And this, according to many Christians through the centuries, is what makes church so important, so vital. Because each and every week, through the preaching of the word and the sharing of the sacraments, we're offered again the word of eternal life. We're offered again, that is, the chance to be encountered by Jesus and his living word. Through preaching and through the sacraments, Jesus' real presence is made manifest in our world, and we are pointed to the one place amid all the upset of this world and life we share that we can look to and know for sure that we will find God in Christ there for us. Now, I want to be clear. This is not to say that God is not at work in other places in the world. But as believing Christians, we confess that this world simply pulses with the presence and activity of its creator. 
in nature, of course, but also in government and family, in the work you do, and in the benefits you receive from the work of others. In all these places and more, God continues to be both present and active, creating and sustaining the whole creation. And yet, each of us knows just how difficult at times it can be to see God there. When nature turns violent or government goes corrupt, when the family is a place of discord and the workplace one of division, when all of the things we usually count on come up empty and we no longer know where to turn, then it is that we may hear the church calling us back to see God clearly at work for us through God's mighty word in the preaching and sacraments of the church, offering us again the promise of forgiveness, acceptance, meaning, and life. Given the challenges we face, I know that preaching and teaching, baptism and communion can seem like small, even paltry things. No wonder disciples then and now had a hard time believing. Yet God has determined to be made most clearly known through neither the grandeur of nature or the accomplishments of humans, but rather through what some people call the weak word of the gospel that we might cling to nothing other than God's word in times of plenty or in need, in times of celebration or sadness, in times of triumph or despair. So come, come now to hear and receive God's life-giving word. Come today and always to hear in Jesus the promise that you have infinite worth in God's eyes, that your life has purpose and meaning, and that through you, God intends to do great things in this world, Come, that is, and receive the word of eternal life, Jesus the Christ, that you might believe in him and believing have life in his name. Amen. God, when others leave you and your word, help us to be true to your Son, Jesus, no matter how hard that choice is and how unpopular. Steady us in our resolve to serve you always, 
and to seek no easier service through Jesus Christ our Lord. With our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we depart today, may God set us free. May we lead lives worthy of our calling, and may your praise be always upon our lips. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be caring towards you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.